Well, it's a, it's a great honor to uh, be here. And again, I must thank uh, Siva for uh, inviting me to this uh, meeting and uh, to, to present my ideas on enhancing uh, respiratory health by veterinary, me my, by veterinary measures. And those of you who heard my talk yesterday, in some respects, this is a, uh, the other side of the equation, where yesterday I talked a bit about reprodu reproductive uh, things that I tried to do on farms, uh, where today we're talking more about the respiratory tract. And to my mind, what the, my uh, philosophy as such as I said yesterday, my philosophy is to promote health rather than treat disease. And so what I do is I spend a lot of time trying to understand what normal anatomy has provided in terms of a defense mechanism. Um, for example, one of the major defense mechanisms we have of the respiratory tract is the nasal turbinates, which spin the air very fast and, and clean the air, warm the air, and dampen the air. Because one of the big issues we have to remember that we can't breathe air. We are fish who live on land. So what we have to do is we have to create the ocean inside ourselves so that we can then reabsorb the oxygen into water, which we can, which we can then, as fish, uh, are able to use that uh, for respiration. So air is actually a relatively dangerous product. So we have to make sure it's clean. We have to make sure that air itself doesn't damage our tissues. And oxygen at quite high concentrations is toxic as well. I mean, our bodies use that as a defense mechanism against bacteria. Going down the pig, we have the next major uh, defense mechanism, which is the tonsils. This is an area where we have an awful lot of uh, microbiota, the, uh, so which it helps to protect the respiratory tract. The tonsils are covered in crypts with a very heavy um, uh, lymphatic system working to try and identify amino uh, proteins and antigens so that the animal produces uh, antibodies against uh, potential respiratory pathogens. And one of the problems that I have with uh, some diagnostics is that uh, some of our diagnostics are almost too accurate. If you want to do PCR for Haemophilus parasurus, the question is why do you get a negative? Because almost every pig should be positive. The question is you maybe didn't sample it in the right area. Um, on the other hand, what does that result mean if you've just done a PCR from office parasuris? It doesn't mean that the pig has got glasses disease. Then we descend down into the, um, into the um, trachea where we have the mucociliary escalator, um, which is a, a, an enormous uh, protective uh, surface that helps to clean the air that gets through the nose. And from an anatomy point of view, we have the right tracheal bronchus, so the uh, artiodactyl family, the, the pigs, have, a, have three bronchi where we have two. And from a health point of view, this is significant from the pig because the uh, symptoms of the pathology that's associated with descending infection is more likely to, to occur then into the right apical um, lobe of the pig. So when you're doing your um, mycoplasma high pneumoniae scores in the slaughterhouse, you would expect to see the lesion first on the right-hand side, and then it would be progressively on the left. And this is just a pure um, example of distance between the mouth or the nose or the outside world and the uh, affected tissues. And knowing these pieces of anatomy or remembering these pieces of anatomy, I find very useful when you're trying to talk to your clients and try to differentiate between descending infections and then um, hematogenous infections such as uh, APP. As I said, the mucociliary escalator has to be defended and we do not spend enough time. And you've got to remember that the mucociliary escalator can be taken out primarily by mycoplasmas, mycoplasmas not just mycoplasma high, high, high pneumoniae, um, high, mycoplasma hyorhinus, uh, flocularis. There's a number of mycoplasmas that live quite naturally on this mucociliary escalator. Some of them are able to penetrate into the pigs, such as uh, high pneumoniae, and then cause a problem. But again, also remember that this problem only lasts for a couple of weeks. In the lifespan of a pig that lives 25 years, it's relatively insignificant. It's majorly significant to us because we only we harvest those pigs at a time when the, when the mycoplasma is still active. If, for instance, we moved to um, 
in Italy and you go to Parma, where the pigs are being harvested at uh, over 200 kilos, you get almost no lesions in the slaughterhouse of uh, mycoplasma. They've had mycoplasma and the animals have recovered. The other major organism here is uh, swine influenza, which can wipe out the mucociliary escalator. And the mucociliary escalator, if that is taken out, then the organisms that live either normally or have colonized the uh, tonsils and the nasopharynx then have greater access down into the lung itself, where we have the lung itself with, with diseases such as APP, and then ultimately the alveolar macrophage, uh, which is taken out by PERTS. So when I teach my students, what I try to teach them is the, um, is the normal anatomy of the pig and how, well, it goes around that way really, and how that normal anatomy all ties up with um, producing um, clinical signs. So for instance, PERS, and if we ignore the high path PERS, but PERS itself should be an irrelevance. I mean, really, what does it matter if the alveolar macrophage dies? If everything else works. But of course, if everything else has failed, and you're now relying on that alveolar macrophage to save that pig, and it's died because of PERS, then PERS becomes very serious. But you can understand a lot more about the pathogenesis of these diseases if you understand how the defense mechanisms work. So, for example, mycoplasma high pneumoniae in my experience, really isn't a eumonic condition. It's a bronchitis or a tracheitis. There is some, as we discussed this last night over dinner, there is, there is some involvement into the lung. I, I'm, not, I'm not denying it. But most of the lesion is a collapse. It's an atelaxis. It's not pathology of the lung tissue itself. Um, but we casually call it pneumonia when you've got a pig clearly coughing its guts up versus actin bacillus pleumoniae, which is clearly a pneumonic condition of which coughing is, uh, can be quite rare uh, because this pig's just dying because it can't breathe. So the problem that we have today is that we have a lot of pathogens that take out various aspects of this defense mechanism and then allow particularly pastorella and streptococci to then set up and cause a pneumonic lesion. We have an increasing problem that A, we've relied heavily on antibiotics, and justifiably, the human population is starting to get concerned about our use of antibiotics, not from the pig point of view, as we heard yesterday, but from uh, the human health point of view. But at the end of the day, if we can find alternative measures that would allow us to reduce our, our reliance on antibiotics, then we need to do so. And when I say, you know, relying on antibiotics, it can't be out of that bottle because that bottle's filthy. And that is far too common. As it happened when I, when I took that particular photograph, the, we had some coughing pigs and the farmer leant over and pulled a needle out of the wall. He took a syringe out of his pocket, put the needle onto the syringe and then asked me how much time you learn to give the pig. So I said to him, five mils, so we filled the syringe, and I told him to bend over. And he looked at me, and I said, well, if it's not good enough for you, it can't be good enough for the pigs. And then he said, if you inject me with that, it'll make me sick. And I go, why is that? He says, because the bottle's filthy, the needle's dirty. So it's not good enough for you, because it'll make you sick, but the pig is what, superhuman? It's able to fight all these diseases? So sometimes the, the, the common sense in, in pig farmers I find a bit of a struggle. You need to give me five minutes, you know, tell me when, because otherwise I'll just keep talking. So when I go to a farm and I look at uh, a farm with a problem, I basically consider nine components. And these nine components are fundamentally biosecurity, pig flow, medicines. And I'll go through these as we go through them. Biosecurity, pig flow, medicines, then the environment, of which we'll talk more at the next speaker, but water, food, floor, air, then the stock, and then the farmer himself or the stockman himself. I've always tried to find a tenth to sort of round it off, but I'm still stuck with my nine. So the first thing, and we, we've talked at the session this morning uh, about the importance of biosecurity. The first thing is about biosecurity, 
clearly if the farm is PERS free, we need to keep it off. If it is mycoplasma free, we need to keep it off. A lot of the other pathogens, APP, are very normal, very common on pigs. Uh, in pigs, so it's, it's difficult to have negative units. Haemophilus parasurus, I'd almost argue, do you want a negative unit? Because if you do have p negative pigs with uh, Haemophilus parasurus, if you ever move them to a normal farm, they'll die. About 60% of them will die with a raging meningitis. It's quite ter terrible. Now, I'm not suggesting we should have uh, armed guards and dogs uh, on our pigs' farms, but for example, we need to take our own biosecurity seriously. Take iPhone 6. iPhone 6 plus water. I mean, they're cheap. I mean, we're veterinarians, so I mean, it's only a couple of hundred bucks. I mean, can you clean your iPhone 6? If you can't clean your iPhone 6, why is it on the farm? It does work. <laughs> assuming the hotel's not. So you have an iPhone 6 that you can wash. If you can't take it, if you can't clean it, it's not allowed on the farm. My camera is an underwater camera, which allows me to do pathology. This I can take photographs of it anyway. And my clients get really alarmed when I have a nice little camera and I'm post-morteming a pig, I'm covered in blood, and taking photographs, the camera's all covered in blood, and they go, your camera, your camera. And then I just walk over to a sink and I give it a wash. They go, ah, oh, it is a waterproof camera. I said, well, why else was it on the farm? And I use it as a teaching opportunity so that my clients start realizing that I'm taking biosecurity seriously. I never take clothes onto clients' farms. All your clients should provide you with boots, overalls. Every single client should never take needles and syringes. There's no need, need to take um, uh, thermometers. The client should provide all of this. You've got to take biosecurity seriously. If you don't, why would your clients? I haven't got, I can spend all day on every one of these nine topics, but Mark is looking at me already thinking he needs to move on, he needs to move on. All in all out, it's worth 100 grams a day. We have some excellent vaccines. But in truth, there's not one vaccine worth 100 grams a day. The, the PCV2 vaccine, fantastic, saved the industry. It's worth about 20 grams a day in terms of growth rate. It, it does stop pigs dying, that's, but that's another issue. But that's all in all out. Cleaning is worth five times the PCV2 vaccine. Almost nobody in the room would consider not using a PCV2 vaccine. And yet, I bet 50% of our clients don't bother washing the room. There's a disconnect somewhere along the line in that, communica in that communication. We've got to get our clients doing all in, all out. We've got to get them cleaning rooms. And this is just an example of a British farm where we have one week, we have 149 pigs being weaned, and another week, we have 60. This is total chaos. And that's what I tried to talk about yesterday in terms of trying to design pig flow models, trying to get people to batch. We've got to stop this variation week on week. And variation. So variation. I have one foot in boiling water and one foot in freezing water. On average, I'm okay. And that is exactly how a lot of our pig farms are being run today. Chaos to chaos. Their average numbers are okay. They're providing me with a lot of work. But to be honest, it's work I don't need because I, I enjoy the, the company of healthy pigs. What I, the reason why I'm a production animal veterinarian is primarily because I don't like seeing sick animals. You work in a small animal clinic you constantly have animals that are sick being brought to you, and I find that very distressing. You have animals that walk the other side of the street because they don't want to walk past the vets because they hate the vet. I find that very distressing. I can do production animal medicine, and I spend all day playing with pigs, other people's pigs. I spend all day playing with pigs, and they are healthy. I rarely see sick animals, and that has to be a goal. I've got water on your computer, Mark. Is that a problem? And so, 
it might be a problem. <laughs> we could discuss the payment for that. Anyway, so this is, this is uh, an example of, of how I try to present this sort of data to my clients. We have the farm in chaos. The blue line is numbers bred. The red line is numbers weaned. In this particular one, I also have numbers finished. And you can see I can track, I can track those three numbers, those four numbers together. And you can basically see how those four numbers fit extremely closely together. You know, you don't normally have finishing pigs down here and breeding up here. Those numbers will follow. When we do have losses, both of those, those dips were associated with an APP outbreak. So I can clearly track, you know, and they didn't tell me. That was what was, what this particular one was a little bit concerning because I was not involved. The, the, the farmer dealt with it himself and it was only when I got the records and I then said, what the hell happened? Why did you, um, why did you lose all these pigs? We have this one here because we had this one with an APP outbreak, we then had this one, so that another load of deaths happened. So by this time, I'm a little bit annoyed, and I said, you know, you've got to tell me what's going on on your farm. How do you expect me to provide help if you don't bother to tell me? And his answer was, uh, the floor broke, and some pigs fell through the floor and drowned. There's little, help, little you could have done. Okay, so disasters do happen, but it does help me to track uh, what, what is going on on the, on the farm. Now, we spend an awful lot of time selling medicines. We sell a lot of time selling medicines. How many of you ever bother to look at how the medicines are stored on the farm? How many of you have a machine, an, ultra, uh, an intra, um, infrared thermometer, that will allow you to measure the temperature of the refrigerator? How many of you know, and I'm being harsh, how many of you know the temperature requirements of tetracycline. Because you probably know how much the fridge is, but almost all the antibiotics also have, have temperature requirements. You know, no more than 25 or no more than 30. And I ask a lot of students, and their answer is room temperature. Well, what the hell's room temperature? As a European, that's 18 degrees. To a nation, 18 degrees is like winter. I mean, I, I come, I, it's, it's fantastic. I spend all my day in summer, because even in your winter, it's like the best day in, in England, I can tell you. So you go to, I mean, I was in Vietnam last week, average temperature was 35 degrees. All of all the antibiotics are too hot. They're just sitting on the shelf. Nobody is paying any attention. This farm in Korea, I'll come back with the, this farm in Korea has a, um, a diarrhea problem in the firing house intermittent diarrhea problem in the farrowing house. And it was all because some of the vaccine was frozen versus some of the vaccine that is not. Because nobody bothered to notice. And so when he picks up the frozen vaccine, he then warms it up. He warmed it up. He told me, oh yeah, from time to time it's frozen. I just warm it up. That's what the farmer said. And you sit there. You know, we pay these lads a lot of money to develop fantastic vaccines for us and this is how we treat the, treat the vaccines. I would, I would be suspicious that if you looked, this is what you'd see on, I'll be, I'll be generous, 50% of your clients' farms. The 100% of your clients' farms are probably abusing medicines today. And whose fault is it? It's not the farmer, because if his, if his veterinary advisor is not providing him with advice, to be honest, it's our fault. Until we step up and say this is not adequate, you are, should not store your medicines this way, it is our fault. Move on. Pigs get sick. It is, it is one of those things that happen on pigs farms. We need to have proper hospital accommodation. And that is with some form of bedding, with some form of heat source with easier access to water, with easier access to, to food. Not just leave the pig in the pen. You leave the pig in the pen, it's going to infect those two pigs with, with the glasses or whatever it's got. Now you've got three pigs that are sick. And those three will make nine. And yet how many people, have, how many of our clients have adequate hospital accommodation? And if you haven't got adequate hospital accommodation, shoot the bloody thing. Because it is better to be dead 
that infect five or six other pigs. We've got to take some serious lessons from some of the poultry operations. If you have a sick chicken on a farm, it doesn't live very long. What you don't do is you don't allow it to infect a bunch of others. The water supply. The water supply on people's farms is pretty dreadful. See this simple little cup, which you can get as a, as a, uh, for camping. Plastic, easy to clean, very flat, punches out, measures 250 mils. You take your washable iPhone 6, gives you a clock, you can then work out the flow of water. Do you know the flow of water? Do you know what height a drink is supposed to be at for each of the age groups of the pigs? Water is as good, or the lack of water, is as good as mycoplasma at taking out the mucociliary escalator. Because the mucus gets thick, mucociliary escalator slows down, that pig is now going to suffer from pneumonia. Without water, the mucus in the stomach gets thicker, much more likely to have a gastric ulcer. Now the animal's hemorrhaging to death, slowly dripping often, not, not necessarily an acute ulcer. Simple, simple little gadgets. This is a case in, in uh, East Yorkshire uh, where it was a farm that I was looking after, a nucleus farm. Went to the slaughterhouse, it was a myco mycoplasma negative unit. Went to the slaughterhouse, we had, I don't know, 100 pigs on the line, 70 of them had small lesions of mycoplasma, of enzootic pneumonia. I closed the farm, we pulled our hair out, we tested, we tested, we found nothing. We found no flu, we found no mycoplasma, and it was in one particular barn. Other barns were perfectly fine. What was wrong was the pigs had a shortage of water because the lines had blocked up because of lime, calcium. Those at the back might struggle to see this. Maybe I'll make, oh no, I can't make it much bigger. This pig here, can we turn the lights down a little bit? Is it possible? Anyway, this pig here is a big pig at weaning. Oh, it was a normal pig at weaning. All the pigs were the same weight. But at 10 weeks, this pig is a big pig. What this pig wants to do is it's trying to dominate the drinker. There's one drinker for 60 pigs. One drinker for 60 pigs. And what this pig is doing, it knows that if it controls the drinker, it will control the eating habits of the other pigs. They don't eat, they don't grow. If you don't grow, you're not a competitor. And so this pig will spend half its day protecting the drinker. You need to watch the pigs. Look at what the pigs are doing. If the pigs are hanging around the drinker, you've got to ask yourself a question why. You don't see kids hanging around taps. So why are the pigs hanging around the drinker? It's not a normal behavior. You should only spend six minutes a day drinking. If you're, if you're hugging the drinker, you've either got diabetes or you're short of water. Watch the pigs. The pigs, you need to talk to the pigs. You can't hear it. It's 43 degrees centigrade it's 43 degrees centigrade, and there is no water in this pen. <coughs> now, I'm asking you to ignore the floor, which is quite unbelievable, which is what I just said. 43 degrees centigrade, there is no water. These pigs have less than 24 hours before they die. And at post-mortem, you will diagnose all sorts of crap. Maybe pneumonia, maybe an enteritis. They died because they had no water. And this is an acute problem because this is obviously one pen. You can have too much water. You can have too little water. Well, I'll just go back to my, this is an American picture. I mean, how on earth is the guy expecting those pigs to grow? You know. <laughs> Actually, Mark, could you come and demonstrate this for me? <laughs> I mean, seriously, and how many, so how many times do you look? We spend our time looking 
At post-mortems, we spend our time bleeding pigs, we spend our time reading lab reports. You need to spend also some time walking the farm, looking at the pigs, the food. Now, this is not necessarily a, uh, a, a uh, respiratory tract problem, in the, but it's a nice picture in the sense that these pigs here had a serious uh, chronic salmonellosis uh, diarrhea problem, and all we did was we covered the feeder, and this was the amount of um, bird feces we had in one month. All of that bird feces would have gone into the pig's uh, intestinal tract previously. And then, is it any wonder they've got diarrhea? As soon as we covered the feeders, the diarrhea stopped. But if you want to think about the respiratory tract, you know, how dusty is the food? When you're making pellets, in the summertime, pellets can be really difficult to stick together. You can have very high dust levels. You combine dust with a respiratory problem, you've got a serious problem. You combine dust with an atrophic rhinitis and a respiratory problem, you've got dead pigs. Stress, more so than um, affecting the mucociliary escalator, but these pigs are clearly hungry. This pig is, is, has moved away, it's given up. If you start having pigs that are giving up, their immune system is starting to fall apart. Healthy buildings rely on one thing, and that's healthy pigs, I presume. And we'll maybe hear a bit more about that in my, in my uh, next speaker, in the next speaker. And this feeder here is supposed to have 10 feed spaces, but two of them are full of uh, feces. So actually got eight feed spaces. And then the guy wonders why the pigs start to get variable, and then he wonders why he has an APP outbreak, because the pigs are too, under too much stress. Talk to the pigs. Get the pigs to talk to you. What are these pigs saying? In pure Yorkshire, they're saying that I'm called. We can all speak pig if you bother to look. I want to check the temperature of a pig barn. I have temperature loggers. Temperature loggers that can be washed so that I can take them from farm to farm. These are ones that are actually used in the fish industry. They're, so they're designed to be submersible. But if they're submersible, I can wash them. Do you want to drink? <laughs> you want to check the, check the air? You know, I walk around with smoke. My clients are fascinated. Every time I'm on a farm, you know, you find somebody who still smokes, Light up, a, light up a smoker, put it on, take a video, you can put clips into your report, you can send the video as part of your report. Clients love that type of stuff. You can then measure wind speed and look at air direction, look at, you know, why are these pigs cold here? Where is the air falling? You can do all of that with a smoke. You can't see air movement unless you put smoke in it. Just out of, out of interest, the clean part of the fan is this bit. Fan maintenance is atrocious on people's farms. This is a farm again in Yorkshire where we have an all-in-all-out system. It's a batching system. All these pigs are the same age. This is one of the advantages of batching. I've got a big enough group. So now the whole building is the same age. Look, why are those vents, why is that vent closed? Why is that vent wide open? Why are those two vents different? Why are we giving different air qualities to these pigs? And why then do we, do, are we surprised when the pigs don't hit the same weight at slaughter, at, at slaughter time? If you don't give the pigs the same environment, why, would, why do you expect them to, to grow it the same? We've got to eliminate variation on our farms, and we create a lot of variation in the way that we house them, our animals. Too much dust in the air, you can see it. I want to finish on these two slides, on, on, on this. So here we have a case in, in, North Car in Iowa, in, in the United States, where we have an 8% post weaning mortality in the nursery, mainly due to uh, meningitis. And what we find is that the pigs are sleeping up by the front of the pen, underneath the, in the drinkers, by the drinkers. And when we put smoke into the room, you can see the smoke comes in, hits another... Uh, pillow of smoke going the other way, 
and then falls onto the back of the pigs and actually where they're supposed to sleep and actually drives the pigs up so that now they're sleeping in the wet under the drinkers. So what did we do? We changed the position of the, of the inlets so now we direct the air into the passageway so the stockman was slightly chilled but he's only in the, pa in the pen a, a couple of minutes a day it actually drives the pigs away from the water towards the sleeping area. 8% pre-weaning, 8% post-weaning mortality with heavy medicine use to try and control the meningitis problem. 2% post-weaning mortality still due to meningitis but no medication. I haven't eliminated the pathogen, I'm living with the pathogen but I'm trying to, to cope with it. We had one pen when it didn't work, well one room when it didn't work. So one pen, the mortality stayed high despite moving the inlets. And what, what you find is that light, unfortunately they placed it to the point where the air came in, hit the light, and then was directed back down onto the pig. So we then, we'd already moved the inlets, so then we had to move the lights. But then once we got that sorted out, the mortality sorted itself out. And then finally, as I did water, food, floor, water, food, water, food, air, and then floor. The floor is a major respiratory problem. And most of you probably don't necessarily think about it. But the floor, any bacteria that enters the skin from the, in, the, in the coronary band or from tail biting or ear biting, the first organ that, that blood goes to is the lung. So you end up with pulmonary abscessation. You are weakening the lungs because you've got bad floors. That means you've got to have good hygiene. And this takes us right back around in the circle, back to good biosecurity. Who drives all of this? I would argue you do. You do, your client does, and the pig does. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a triangle between the vet, the client, and the pig. Our duty is to Mr. Pig. Our duty is also to Mr. Farmer, and obviously our duty is to ourselves. But if we can get the biosecurity pig flow medicines, water, food, floor, air, stock, stock people right, then the SIBO vaccines have a chance to be the excellent products we all know they are. Thank you very much.